comic weekly man, the jolly comic weekly man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's comic weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the Jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm so excited, I can just hardly wait. Excited about what? Can't you guess? Why no? I have no idea at all. Oh. My, you grown-ups, Christmas is coming in one week. Oh, that's right. Jolly old St. Nicholas, little Jack Horner who pulled out a plum. And, and jingle bells and, and presents and, and... Don't you just love it? <laughs> I certainly do, and I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful Christmas. Oh, Christmas is wonderful always. Yes, it is. Just because it's Christmas. That's so true. Now, please read me the funny. Talk to the Comic Weekly. Mm -hmm. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on top of the first page... Oh, that sweet little snookums. Oh, so it is. And I'll read that right away. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <coughs> Diddly-da, diddly-do, wake a a mookums Let's have a little tune for little snookums. <laughs> Archie is downtown with Snookums. Archie turns his head, and a second later, Snookums is walking right out toward the street. And Archie screeches, Snookums, come here! How many times have I told you not to leave Papa's side? <laughs> Archie takes Snookums' hand, and they walk along a little further. As they chat, Snookums pulls his hand away. When Archie looks down... He sees that Snookums has disappeared again. And last picture, top row, Archie sees him heading for the curb, and he screeches, Snookums, didn't I tell you not to leave my side? <laughs> First picture, bottom row, they come to a toy store. And the sign in the window reads, Sale, Junior Cop Outfit. And that gives Archie a bright idea. And a second later, they're in the store, and Archie has bought the Junior Cop Outfit. The salesman asks, Shall I wrap it up, sir? And Archie replies, No, no, no. Keep the box. I'll wear it. And last picture of the row, Archie and Snookums are walking down the street. Archie is wearing the policeman's star, carrying the club, and little Snookums is handcuffed to Archie. Wasn't that clever? <laughs> he handcuffs little Snookums to him so that he can't get away. Yes, that was a very bright <laughs> idea and much safer. Yes. Oh, I think it's fun playing cops that way. Yes, but Snookums doesn't look as happy about that as though you'd think he would. Well, I guess he's more curious about the things that he can see in the street. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Well, at any rate, now Snookums won't get run over by a car. No, and you should always be careful not to go in the street, especially when you're a little boy or a little girl. Oh, I'm glad you told that to all of your friends who are listening. I hope they mind me. Oh, I'm sure they will. Good. Oh, over the page quick to Flash Gordon, because Flash is on a strange planet, and the wizard, who doesn't like Flash, tried to get Flash killed dead, but Flash fooled him. Yes, and now Flash is safe. But today, the wizard is going to make Dale go through her ordeal. I think he's a cruel, mean thing. Please read, and let's see what's going to be in how it turns out. All right, very well. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doons, ask him a tash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. Flash has come safely through his ordeal, but Dale has still to face hers. Ignoring Flash's protests, Wizard Curzo sentences Dale to the ordeal of the madfish. All Queen Suni can do is to let Flash say farewell to Dale. Armed only with a plastic dagger... Dale is forced to plunge into the ray-lighted pool where lurking perils await her. Huge fish with sharp teeth rush at Dale and snap at her. Last picture top row, frenzied by the ray light, the mad fish attack Dale fiercely. She fights back as best she can. Flash groans, 
Oh, it's not fair. She hasn't a chance. And then first picture bottom row. Flash snatches Suni's jewel dagger and dives to Dale's aid. Herzo moves to interfere. But Queen Suni warns that Flash isn't breaking any of his laws, that he never dreamed anyone would be devoted enough to risk sharing a victim's fate. Not even the vicious madfish can outfight Flash when he's defending Dale. And Dale does her full share, forgetting her own danger and her anxiety to keep harm from befalling Flash. And together, they drive off the madfish. As Flash and Dale climb out of the pool, last picture, Queen Suni tells Curzo there's nothing more he can do to them, that they've survived their ordeals, and that she's now going to take Flash and Dale back to the palace. The wizard frowns and warns, It's your mistake, and you'll answer to me if these intruders from space break our laws against metal. Does he mean that if Flash were to try to make a metal ship so that he can get off the planet, that he will try to kill him again? Yes. Well, that means that Flash will just have to stay there forever and ever. It certainly looks that way, unless he could build a plastic ship of some kind. Oh, I hope he can. I hope he can. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Oh, look, underneath Flash Gordon, there's Roy Rogers way up there in the front. Yes, you've been so eager to read him that I thought I'd move him up here. Goody. Let's see what new adventure Roy starts today. All right, here we go with Roy Rogers. A yip pio Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip pio <laughs> Roy gallops down the trail leading through the mountains on his way to an Indian reservation where he plans to sell some cattle. He sees a fort along the road. The fort has been deserted ever since the Indians made peace with the white men. As Roy nears it, suddenly he hears a shot and a boy in a pony gallops out of the fort furiously. He hears the boy shout, last picture top row. Run, Clover, he's after us. First picture next row, there's another shot. And a man on a horse gallops out of the fort chasing the boy. And he shouts, Stop, you young scamp! I'll blast you out of the saddle! In a second, Roy has his lariat out, tears after the man who's firing at the boy. He flips his lariat. And in a second, Roy has jerked the old man off the horse. Last picture of the row. The man snarls, hey, What's the idea of roping me, you crazy cowpoke? Roy exclaims, The kid's horse stumbled. You'll be hurt. So he gallops after the boy. First picture, bottom row. The boy jumps to his feet and runs to the cliff. Roy calls, Hey, hey, don't run. I'm your friend. The boy cries, Hey, leave me alone. And then suddenly he leaps over the cliff into the river below. The boy jumps off trigger and runs to the edge of the cliff to look after the boy. At this moment, the man who is chasing the boy has worked himself loose of the rope and has picked up a rifle and is sneaking up behind Roy. Roy says to himself, Last picture. He can't fight those rapids. He'll drown. Here, grab something and hang on, Sonny. I'm coming. Oh, is Roy going to jump into the river after the boy? I'm afraid he is because the water is extremely fast right there, and he thinks it's too much for the boy. Oh, this is terribly dangerous because if Roy jumps into the water, he might be drowned. And But still, if he doesn't, will that mean man with the beard and the coonskin cap just might shoot him? Yes, say, hey, this is certainly an exciting beginning to this new adventure, isn't it? Oh, I should say so. And maybe next week Roy will work his way out of danger. I hope so. Now, cross the page, please, to Dick's adventures. Such wonderful things are happening in Dick's adventures because Dick is in the early days of America when this country was just beginning. Yes, when it was struggling to gain its freedom from England. And Dick has been dreaming that he's with George Washington. So now let's see what adventure he has today. Here we go with Dick's Adventures. And say the magic words with me. Riggity pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for Adventurous Dick. In his dream, Dick finds himself back in 1776, marching with the first American militia under General Washington. The road leads out of Boston south toward New York, now threatened with capture by the King's Redcoats. It's a hot, dusty midsummer day. Last picture, top row, the men stop for a little rest. As Dick stretches out on the ground, his comrade says, Eh, fine armor we got. Not enough guns, not enough bullets. Shucks, we ain't even told the kind we're free and independent. Dick murmurs drowsily. Oh, today's the 4th of July. 
Independence Day. And I thought Thomas Jefferson and Philadelphia. <sighs> and Dick falls off asleep. He dreams that he's walking down the streets of Philadelphia. First picture next row, a man there selling newspapers says, Newspaper, sir? The Philadelphia Gazette? Full account of the rebellion against the British. Dick exclaims, hey, Gosh, I must be in Philadelphia. Well, thanks, I'll take a paper. The man goes on, Best newspaper in the colonies, Corporal. The editor is one of the finest writers, finest statesmen, finest scientists in the world. One of the greatest American patriots. Dick exclaims, Benjamin Franklin? But I don't see anything about the Declaration of Independence. And shouldn't the Liberty Bell be ringing? Puzzled, the old man shakes his head. Dick sees two men passing by across the street. Last picture of the row, as Dick watches, the two men walk rapidly into the printing shop. The old man exclaims, Oh, it's Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. They've been with Mr. Franklin for days. Dick sees a sign atop the store. It reads, Philadelphia Gazette, Benjamin Franklin. First picture, bottom row. A few minutes later, the door of the printing shop abruptly opens, and an elderly man peers out over his spectacles. Spying Dick, he calls, Oh, uh, come here, please. The man selling newspapers says, oh, It's Mr. Franklin. Last picture, Dick exclaims softly, well, I wonder what he wants with me. Oh, coming, sir. <laughs> Yes. Isn't it wonderful? Mm. Dick is meeting all these famous, famous Americans. Isn't this something, though? Yes, and I know something else Benjamin Franklin did. He invented the lightning rod. Yes. He invented with the kite. Say, you remember well. Yes, I do, do I? Uh Uh-huh, and now... Oh, look, underneath Dick's adventures, Rusty Riley. And I'll read that in just a moment, but first here's that man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the bottom of page three of the first section with Rusty Riley. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty and Patty had taken the boat out in the inlet to test it. The motor died, and there, out on the open water, the two were marooned. Darkness fell, and a little later, the smugglers came toward them and dropped anchor within speaking distance. Rusty and Patty overheard the smugglers at their crooked business. Then, a little later, Mr. Kilgore, the government treasury agent, a man whose work is much like a detective, came in the Coast Guard cruiser. The Coast Guardman went aboard the smuggler's boat and searched it. As Mr. Kilgore gets back into the Coast Guard cruiser, one of the smugglers says... Well, Mr. T-Man, are you satisfied we ain't breaking no laws? Mr. Kilgore replies, Yes, you seem to be clean. Sorry we had to bother you, but you know how it is. And the Coast Guard cruiser pulls away. As the boat pulls away, one of the smugglers says to his pals, Now, you should have chucked that black light gadget over the side. We'd have had plenty of trouble trying to explain it. Oh, he didn't see it. I had it stowed under a coil of rope in the chain locker. At this moment, last picture, top row, on the Coast Guard cruiser, one of the men says to Mr. Kilgore, Well, excuse me, Mr. Kilgore. We just got a radio flash from the station. A couple of kids are supposed to be out here in the inlet in a motorboat lost. Mr. Kilgore says, Hmm. Well, okay. We'll play the searchlight around. We should be able to pick them up. And in a second, the searchlight picks out Rusty's boat. They head for it as Rusty throws up his hands. First picture, bottom row, calling, Hey, help, over here! Coast Guard cruiser pulls up beside Rusty's boat. Mr. Kilgore exclaims, Well, by George, it's the youngsters from the Miles place. And a moment later, Rusty and Patty are in the Coast Guard cruiser on their way back to shore. As they head back, Rusty tells Mr. Kilgore, Yeah, we ran out of gas. We were just going to yell to that other boat when we heard him talking about Captain Clune's lobster pots. Patty tells him she thought that they were going to rob the lobster pots. 
Mr. Kilgore says thoughtfully. Say, maybe they are. Well, we'll keep an eye on them. Later that night, as Rusty's getting ready for bed, he's talking to Tex. Suddenly, he says to Tex, Hey, Tex, what the dickens is a black light? Tex replies thoughtfully, Black light? By jingo, I was just reading something about that in the science magazine. I can't just recollect, Rusty, but I'll give you the article. You can read it. Oh, goody. Maybe next week we'll find out all about what that black light is. Yes, maybe we will. And that maybe we'll find that it's a clue that'll help Rusty catch the smugglers and then he will be a hero. Yeah, maybe so. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. Good. Now... Oh, now is the time for my funny, funny friend, Dag. It is indeed. <laughs> so let's pick up the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly and here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim Zam Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Mr. Dithers is talking to his friend Donald, a very timid-looking man. Mr. Dithers is saying to Donald, Ah, Donald, you should get married. You're missing so much. And at the thought of getting married, Donald's eyes pop open. Mr. Dithers takes him by the arm and says, Ah, uh, let me take you over to the Bumsteads and show you a happy man. And even though Donald holds back, Mr. Dithers drags him over to the Bumsteads' door. <laughs> Last picture top row, as they stand on the Bumstead's doorstep, Mr. Dithers says, Here's his home, his own little castle, and he's treated like a king in there. Donald looks very nervous. And Mr. Dithers rings the doorbell. First picture next row, it's opened by Blondie. And Mr. Dithers points to Blondie, saying, Ah, uh, and look at the beautiful little wife he has to greet him after a hard day's work. Mr. Dithers takes Donald to the kitchen. He looks in the oven and says, Yeah, look at the delicious dinner she has cooked for him. Smell that apple pie for his dessert. Donald licks his lips hungrily. Last picture of the row, Mr. Dithers points out Alexander, Cookie, and the dogs quietly enjoying themselves, and he says, And little children and pets to bring joy and comfort. Beautiful, isn't it? And Donald holds his hat reverently in this one moment of peace and quiet, which is the children's hour. First picture next row, Mr. Dithers shows him through the living room, and he says, And look, isn't this cute? Little flowers and doilies all around to give the homey feeling. That's the woman's touch. Then Mr. Dithers takes Donald upstairs and shows him Dagwood's bedroom and bureau and says, Yeah, look, everything is done for him. See how carefully she places his shirts and handkerchiefs in his bureau? And Donald's face lights up happily as he asks, You mean he doesn't even have to rub out his own socks? Next picture, Mr. Dithers points out Dagwood, who is smoking his pipe in a comfortable chair, reading a paper, and he says... And there you see the contented husband with his pipe and slippers. A happy man. And Donald says, If that settles it, I'm going to get married. First picture, bottom row, Donald says to himself thoughtfully, Now let's see, who shall I propose to? Rosemary? Victoria? Avira? A Marie? And Dagwood happens to see Mr. Dithers, and he jumps out of his chair saying, Oh, Mr. Dithers, may I speak to you a minute? May I borrow 50 cents until payday? And Donald's eyes pop open in amazement. And Mr. Dithers goes... <coughs> and last picture, Donald is tearing down the street with Mr. Dithers after him trying to catch him. And Dithers says, Now, now, money isn't everything, Donald. And Donald yells, Yeah, I know, but it's, it's nice stuff to have in your pockets. <laughs> That silly man, he decides to get married until he found out that Dagwood didn't have any money. <laughs> yes. Well, being married is expensive, and a man has to work very hard to pay for his house and a car and buy clothes for his wife and feed his children and buy clothes for the children. And food for the dogs. 
Yes, yes. But even so, all the money in the world couldn't take the place of a lovely family and a lovely home. Yes, because the home is so romantic. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, now... Oh, look, that here ended Blondie is Donald Duck all good for a chuckle. And I know you want to read that, so (laughs) here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squiddly chicka chack. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Donald's girlfriend, Daisy, has asked Donald to come over to help her rearrange her furniture. Donald comes in the door, second picture, saying, Hi, Toots. Let's get started. So he rolls up his sleeves. And Daisy tells him, Well, first, I want the Davenport over there. Donald flexes his muscles, glares at the sofa, and gives it a push, and it sails across the room. And one, two, three. Donald has moved all of the furniture around. He surveys the room proudly, last picture of the row, saying, I'm a fast worker, Toots. Then Daisy points to a big, squatty chair, saying, Well, now, I'd like that chair moved into the next room. So Donald flexes his muscles, glares at the chair, and starts pushing it toward the door. And Daisy asks, first picture, bottom row, Uh, Hadn't you better tip it sideways? And Donald exclaims, Nah, it'll go through easy. And he gives it a shove through the door. And the chair is stuck in the door. Donald pushes and pushes. But the chair won't move. And Donald exclaims, Seems to be a tight squeeze. So he goes around to the other room and tries to push it back. But the chair won't move. Donald exclaims, Wow, wow. Sort of seems slightly stuck. Daisy says, Well, I can't wait any longer. I have shopping to do. As she goes out the door, she tells him, And don't you dare go away and leave that blocking my doorway. And Donald replies cheerfully, Don't worry, Toots. Your door won't be blocked when you get back. Later in the afternoon, Daisy returns home after doing her shopping. She walks into her living room, and last picture sees the chair still stuck in the doorway. But a ladder has been set up over it, so she can climb up over the ladder on one side and down into the other room on the other side. And as Daisy stares at it, she feels just like this. (laughs) Wasn't that clever? Donald gets the chair stuck in the door, and then when he can't get it out, he builds a ladder so that she has to go from one room to another on the ladder. I think that's the funniest thing. (laughs) <laughs> that Donald has some funny ideas. Yes, he certainly has. Well, now shall we see what Prince Valiant is doing? Oh, yes, because he came to a strange castle, and he asked if he could stay there overnight. And then the next morning when he got up, the castle was being attacked, and now Prince Valiant has to stay there, and there's going to be a big battle. So here we go, over to the last page to Prince Valiant and the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Prince Valiant, Eagle, Rufus, and Arf enjoy a night's lodging, but their awakening is rude. Before they can leave, the castle is attacked. Their host, the king of the castle, Rifuk, comes to Val, buckling on his helmet, and he tells him, Your loss is my gain, for this is a fight to the finish, and every fighting man is welcome. Last picture, top row, he points to the enemy outside the castle, and Val sees in the distance the leader of the enemy, a tall, fierce-looking man, and Ree says, Yonder stands my enemy, Black Robert, a brave and ruthless captain. Only one of us can survive this battle. First picture next row, Val and his friends tour the castle to become familiar with its defenses. There is none of the confusion that usually attends preparations for an attack, where these two unyielding enemies have planned each other's downfall for many years. Val watches as baskets of arrows are set up behind the parapets and workmen prepare the huge catapult. Every precaution is taken to defend the castle. Last picture of the row, we see the army outside the castle. They're preparing for the attack. Foot soldiers surround the castle, and later in the day, the war engines, ram, ballista, mangonel, and catapult thunder into action against the main gate. 
For two days, the stout, iron-studded gates withstand the terrible battering, and then they splinter and fall. But in the meantime, Sir Ree has sealed up the arch with masonry, and first picture bottom row, the attackers find themselves face to face with a blank wall of stone. Black Robert hurls one assault after another, probing, searching for a weak spot in the defenses. He sends his men against the castle with scaling ladders. But as they climb up the ladders, seeking to go into the castle, the ladders are pushed from the walls, and his men are thrown back. Last picture, Val's friend, Reef Wook, says, as he notices his enemy still trying and trying to break through, Our enemies show unexpected strength. A messenger must get through to ask my brothers for help. I wouldn't be surprised if either Val or one of his friends did. That would be exciting. Yes, but dangerous, too. I can hardly wait to see what happens. Oh, this is going to be a very busy week of waiting for you. <laughs> Christmas and next week's comics. Yes, and I'll see you next week, and then it will be Christmas. And then, too, we'll see what happens in the funny. <laughs> yes, we certainly will. And I hope that you and every other boy and girl has the most wonderful Christmas they ever had. Yes, and I hope so, too. Mm-hmm. Well, now that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Bigley, man. But I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs> 